The most beautiful view comes after the hardest climb. Today we're going to talk to someone who made his way to the top, not only in his company, but also to the top of Kilimanjaro, and you won't even believe who he took along with him. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Happy holidays. I'm LJ, and here is Lon Dolber, who's going to tell us a little bit about how he made his way to the top. And you started your business on 9-11, and now you were just in Newsday for being one of the most... Well, we have the best company on Long Island to work awesome. for so, in our category. Absolutely amazing. Category. So thank, thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for being here. And not only that, you made it to the top of the mountain, and I just want to get to all the details because you are an incredible person. I've gotten to get to know you over the past several weeks, and you. I, I want everyone to see what an incredible person you are and such a big heart that you have. And I just want to take it back to the beginning, and 9-11 is a day that we'll never forget, and here you were just opening your doors to your company on 9-11. Can you tell us a little bit about that day where you were on 9-11 and starting your business and yeah sure I had spent uh, you know 10 15 years wait you know building uh, to the point where I could start my own financial service company and uh, the date that we set was uh, you know September 11th 2001 to be our first official day in business and on that day I left my house you know a little bit late because we were up all night getting our systems up and running trading systems and what have you and I remember telling my wife uh, this is my first day running a business I wonder what it's going to be like I showed up at the office and my eight employees were standing watching the first tower uh, mm -hmm. on fire you know when you're in the financial service business you know you you have to be up and running every day the market is open if the market's closed and it's not supposed to be closed uh, you'll be losing money every single day and I thought to myself uh, we're gonna go out of business and you know for all the time and energy I put in and I have to admit I, I was it was really kind of a selfish thing I wasn't thinking at that point they thought maybe 10,000 people had died right. uh, I was just thinking about myself and um, you know that we were gonna lose the business I would I had mortgaged my house to do it and um, I remember calling my wife and telling her that I thought that we were gonna lose the business right. and maybe have to lose the house right. and uh, you know which you didn't which I didn't. Which you but didn't. And I want to get there in just a second because I, I know everybody can remember, yeah. you know, where they were and just how yeah. much our lives have changed. And I remember telling my mom, like, I just can't go to school today. She's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, I just can't go to school today. I don't know how I got away with it because my mom would always be like, nope, yeah, you have to go to school. And at that moment, I was like, yeah, something just didn't feel right. I just felt like the world, something was just off. And I couldn't explain it because it wasn't that I had a headache. It wasn't that. It just felt something was completely wrong. And, you know, I just rolled back over, went to bed. I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with me, but maybe it's my, you know, now when I look back, all the empathy that I had and just something didn't feel right and it wasn't. And I remember my mom downstairs and my dad and all of a sudden just screaming that this had happened. I went down, and like yourself, I'm like, no, this can't be a terrorist attack. This can't be, you know, what it is. And it was. And I know that yeah. from that day after, everyone's lives changed. I, actually, for me, when I left the house, it was blue sky. Mm -hmm. I was thinking this is going to be the best day of my life. I, I couldn't imagine what I was going to face. Everything seemed perfect. All our systems were up and running. We were up late, but uh, everything was working. And I was anticipating my first day in business. Right. And, um, and then, of course, it wasn't meant to be. But on the other hand, uh, later in the week, I saw a fellow who had lost right. 500 of his employees that were on the 105th floor. And he was saying that uh, he, he was actually crying on TV, but he said that he was going to rebuild his business. And I thought, wow. You know, he's going to rebuild his business. I mean, if he can do it, then what am I complaining about? You know, I have eight employees. They're all safe. If he can do it, I can do it. And of course, that it's just such an American point of view. It's the American way. You, uh, through adversity, you push forward. And mm -hmm. um, exactly. I called my wife immediately and said, uh, Deborah, uh, don't worry. We're going to find a way. Uh, it's going to be okay. And that's the great thing about. Mm -hmm. the American spirit we support each other and right. uh, that helps us move forward right and now someone inspired you yes. and here you are inspiring other people and you went from eight employees please tell everybody how many employees you have now well we went from eight employees to about 130 from about 45 advisors to 800 2,500 square feet of space to 45,000 square Amazing. feet of space which is primarily empty right now right. but that's another story and uh, from significant amount of revenue we started with about you know uh, six, seven million, we're close to a 200 million top line revenue firm. So we've managed to do well, uh, even with the adversity of what happened in that 
right. you know, first couple of weeks. Right. You looked at that tragedy, and like you said, you were like, you called your wife, you were like, listen, we're going to have to put the house up all that and you decided nope I'm gonna do this and you show that you could turn tragedy into triumph and that's why I was so touched yeah. by your story and there's so much more to the story we're just touching on it yeah, right now yeah. but you could have been like well you know what and I think it gives people a lot of hope right now especially with the times that we're in that you know with lockdowns and things are closing and businesses are, are shutting down but I think you can give hope to a lot of people I mean that was the first day on the job for you and look where you are now and I just think you know that's amazing giving hope to other people who are not sure where their business is gonna well, lead. And that comes from uh uh, from a leadership perspective when you hear other people say that we're, we're gonna make it and they've had much more adversity than you've had you go well if they make it if they can make it I can make it too and that's a, a great feeling absolutely so it's a great inspiration that you are and when you're not working on your financial company you're doing something else well in actuality I think from that experience I decided I would run the the business on a a stakeholder basis, not just a shareholder basis. And from a stakeholder basis, it would mean that I would, uh, take, I would take care of my employees, my advisors who are the customers, the community, and shareholders. So I, I was committed that all of the stakeholders would see value in the business. So I moved forward with that way of thinking. So that was a big change in my mindset. Uh, you know, a lot of companies are built just on shareholder, you know, stakeholders and that's mm -hmm. it but uh, we have other stakeholders and I'm determined to take care of our employees and our customer and our community and so I, I can remember speaking at one of my conferences and telling the advisors who we support that you know they're all going to do well but they should also be good citizens and do good work in the community because mm -hmm. it's you know we, we can make money making money is not the hardest thing in the world but affecting somebody's life well that's not so easy to affect people's lives and even to affect one person is not so easy. Exactly. Imagine if you affect five or 10 or 15 or 20. And, and when I was speaking, there was an individual in the audience that was the uh, chairman of World Team Sports, which right. I am now the vice, vice chairman of. Vice chairman, that's amazing. And he approached me after listening to me speak about uh, you know, community involvement and asked me, how would you like to climb the tallest free standing mountain in the world? I actually said to him, no, I would not. I knew he was talking <laughs> about Mount Kilimanjaro. Because I've done a lot of climbing. I've climbed in the Himalayas. I've climbed uh, up in Alaska and more when I was younger. But I, I knew that this was not a climb I would normally want to make. It, you know, it's, it's a challenge because you go almost at 20,000 feet. But it's pretty much a hike. And I just, but then he s says, well, no, no, let me explain why you might right, want to do this. Right. He said, 25 years earlier, I took 20 individuals that were physically challenged. And they were teenagers and we took them on a climb. And that's the mission of World Team Sports. You take able-bodied individuals, you pair them with individuals that are emotionally or physically challenged, and you do a sporting event. And he took these 25 teenagers on the climb. Uh, seven of those teenagers did not make it to the top because a storm broke out at 18,000 feet. Wow. And they made a movie called Let Me Be Brave. And uh, in the movie, you can see them all you know, upset and crying, and there's Jim telling them, uh, I'm gonna take you back. I promise you'll come back. So here it is 25 years later, and he's telling me this story. And I says, well, so you're taking them back now? He, he says, yes, they've been training for a year. We're going to go back. And I think you would be a good person to have on the climb. Mm -hmm. And my first reaction was, well, I don't know. I mean, what are you going to want me to do? Like, you know, put your jacket on, you know, drink your water, put your crampons on. You're not breathing right. It, you know, I know what coaching on a climb is like. It's a lot of work. He says, no, listen, you'll get more than you will give. Right. And, and I told him, well, I, didn't, I don't really believe it. And, of course, he said, well, the only way to find out is if you go. I said, well, when do I have to let you know? Mm -hmm. He said, tomorrow. I said, in one day, you want me to tell you tomorrow whether I'm going to f go to Africa <laughs> and climb this mountain? Right. You know, so I will leave you with this thought. Uh, I decided to go. And Ernest Hemingway said in Africa, what is true in the morning is a lie by noon. What was true for me is I was going as a teacher, as a coach. But instead, I came back as a student because I witnessed something uh, that you could only witness if you spent that much time with individuals that are physically or emotionally challenged to see what it meant to them to get to the top of that mountain. That's amazing. So you went from finances to, to volunteering yeah. and becoming this. And I, I know we want to hear so much more. I want to know about your experience. I know you shared some wonderful stories with me. Yeah. We're going to take a short break and we're going to talk about some of the people that you met along the way and that helped you grow and what you continue to do for them today. Okay. So we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back.
Hey, it's me, LJ. I'm only five feet, but my journey is huge. Right after marrying my sweetheart, my world suddenly collapsed. I endured multiple back surgeries and rare health conditions, and I saved the life in the process by donating my kidney. I hit rock bottom pretty hard, but now I'm on top. Since then, I've become a minister, a coach, and a media. And oh yeah, I also wrote a book. Now I'm fulfilling my lifelong dream and hosting my very own talk show, The LJ Show. Join me for stories of hope and inspiration. Welcome back, everybody. We're here with Lon, and Lon is just sharing with us how he made it to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. And not only did you go by yourself, but you went with incredible people. Can you tell us a little bit about those people and why they are different? Yeah, well, you know, um, they had different challenges. And um, of course, if you go on one of these climbs, you'll find out how you're challenged. We're all challenged. You just have to be put do in you think situation. I could do one of those climbs? I think you could. Oh. I think you could. And what what I love about World Team Sports is that you, you know the events tend to be uh, either a full day or multiple days, and it takes that much time to really be with somebody that's different than you are to recognize their humanity. I mean, you know, most of us when we see somebody that's different, mm -hmm. particularly somebody that's maybe in a wheelchair, we tend to turn away. And believe me, the person sees that. Now we don't turn away because because we're being mean. We just don't know what to think. We don't know what to say. So mm -hmm. we turn away. I can tell you that that is, is noticed by the person in the wheelchair. And um, I never do that anymore because I understand that there's no need to turn away. Yeah. Go over, say hello. The person in that wheelchair is just like you. But these events and being on that mountain, I learned that because I spent you know 15 days with individuals that were physically or emotionally challenged. Yeah. And I witnessed their humanity, which is what is, what yeah. is so great about these events. And I'm glad you brought that up and I just wanted to just add to that as well because when you say people in a wheelchair wheelchair do feel that they're looked at differently, I have to agree because if you're watching and, and you didn't know this about me, I was also in a wheelchair for nearly two years from a spine injury and I can tell you I got a lot of looks, people didn't know what to do, do I open the door, what's wrong with her, but I felt like yeah we, I had a physical disability at the moment, I had a, a, a challenge, but I also feel like people think you're not capable as well. Do you understand? Because I know you, I we had talked a little bit about that, and I really connected with that. You know, I had a spine injury. There was nothing else wrong with me mentally. I, I would have liked for people to say hello, and you, you do get treated differently. And I have a lot of empathy for people who have to live in wheelchairs. I'm thankful that I'm up and I, I can walk now. But I can re literally relate to those people who you, you do get, you do get looked at differently. I, I often say, you know, one of the models of World Team is if we all ride the same road and we ride together, we'll get where we're going. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember on that climb. I would tell you, I might not have got to the summit. I, I might have, like, I was thinking about it. Maybe halfway up, I would have said, this is like a miserable climb. I'm going to go back to the Impala Hotel in Arusha <laughs> and be sipping martinis. I got to the top because those athletes that I was with got mm -hmm. me to the top. And that's what the world team is all about. I can remember w one day, you know what, you don't climb a mountain mm -hmm. all at once. You go up, you come down a little bit, you go up, you come down to acclimatize. So we were going up to 15,000 feet, and then we would come back down to 11,000 feet to sleep. And on the way down, I got sick. I, when I say sick, just very sick. Mm -hmm. And I had one of the athletes right behind me, you know, and we were coming down a steep ravine, and I was like bent over in so much pain. And I remember I looked back to see where he was, and he just winked at me. <laughs> Do you imagine that? Like, he winked at me to say, don't worry, you'll be okay. All right, if you don't mind me interrupting, though, what challenges did most of these athletes face? It could be, uh, that might be on the spectrum, it could be uh, cerebral palsy, it was various mm -hmm. different things and uh, uh, this fellow was reasonably shaky on that route but he knew that I was in pain and he just winked at me to say like don't worry and so we <laughs> walked around the rim of the volcano to get to the high point just as the sun was coming up in the Rift Valley which is ten times the size of the Grand Canyon and I remember seeing the sign at the top, because I read in a book there was a sign at the top of Kilimanjaro that says, Welcome to the top of the African continent. Mm. And I decided that maybe I wouldn't go to the top, but I would step off the route and allow the athletes to move past me, and I could watch them go. Oh, and the one individual that was right behind me, I remember, he didn't really talk to me much in camp. You know, he'd sit a lot by himself with headphones on. And if, I, if you went over and talked with me, he would talk with you, but didn't say much. And... I said, hey, you take everybody to the top. And um, he, I got out of his way. 
didn't say anything to me. As soon as I got out of his way, he kept going. And everybody followed, and I watched him go to the top. I bring this up because uh, when the climb was over, we had a flight from Arusha to Amsterdam. The seven athletes were all going to L L.A. I had a later flight going to New York, and I decided to go to their gate to see them off. And they're all going through the gate, and this one individual stopped, hadn't said a word to me, but came back to see me with his head down and goes, I'll always remember I took everybody to the top. Oh, my and, God. And that's the only thing he's, you know, he was the only thing he said to me. That's all he needed to say. He knew, you yeah, know, he, sometimes. He, well, that's the thing. Here mm -hmm. again, I, I love the work of the world team because you, you get the opportunity to see the humanity of, of people, but not necessarily how they're different. And, that's, and it changes you. Tell us a little bit, how, how has it changed you since that day? Well, uh, there's mm -hmm. a couple things. I mean, if I see somebody that's physically, emotionally different, I'm not going to turn away. You know, so, you know, I'm not going to do what I would have done in the past. And um, I'm going to understand that this is a human being. They're, they're, they, you know, there's, they have the same humanity that I have. You just got to spend the time to discover that. So I'll take the time to discover that. And that's why I like bringing, when we do these events, I'll bring family and friends and staff, employees and advisors on the events, whether it's a 10-day you know, kayak trip with soldiers that are physically challenged mm -hmm. or whether it's a two-day bicycle ride from the Pentagon to Gettysburg. Yeah, and you told me, right, that you had somebody, he was missing both legs, right, he was a vet. Yeah. And you talked to him about it, he wanted to do it, and you were able to get him a bike to do it. Well, he, he actually had a bike, but the rule was he couldn't keep the bike if he didn't ride 26 miles in it. It was given to him by the Achilles Foundation, if I remember it. And so I tried to get him to ride with me, and months would go by, and he wouldn't show up at the office. And then one day, I got a call, Lon, that soldier's here. And I go, who? I've forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris. And I went outside, and there was Chris, and he always calls me sir, and I remind him, that's my father, don't call me sir, but, you know, very formal. He said, is that office still open that you'll ride with me? I said, yes, show up at my house with your bicycle, with your, you know, uh, cycle, and uh, we'll ride. But, of course, I didn't know much about hand cycles, so I called my friend George, who's a quadriplegic. Mm -hmm. He's paralyzed from the chest down, and I've been riding with him. And I said, George, you've got to come and show Chris how to use that bike. So he shows up. They all have special cars. And, uh, and that day where I thought we would just ride around the block, we ended up riding 26, 30 miles. And I remember Chris telling me it was the best thing that had ever happened. Incredible. That is so imagine incredible. that, you know, that. So when you experience that, you're with, you know, first you're with a soldier that has served this country, which yeah. is incredible. Mm -hmm. And then you're with another individual that's paralyzed from the chest down. And then there's me with them doing something, doing an event, you know, it's just, it just changes you. You'll never look at a person that's physically different the same way. Right, and I think that's a big message. Like, someone thinks they can't do something, they can, because there's no excuse with other people with what they're face the challenges that they're facing and continue to do what they do. And I remember you asked me, um, you said, would I, because you're going to Gettysburg, right, in the yeah. spring, and you said, uh, would you ride? And I was like, oh, wow. I don't have, first of all, how long's the bike ride? Well, it's two days, 110 two days. miles. And I said to you, and I'm like, and I was really touched by that because I said I absolutely would. And why would I? Number one, I faced that limitation. I was told in the past that I would never be able to ride a bike. And actually, during uh, quarantine, I learned to ride a bike again, a regular bike. So that was truly amazing because you don't realize the things that we take for granted and challenge. And I said to you, well, you know, I just learned to ride a bike, but because of my spine, there's only a particular bike yeah. that I could ride. And you said to me, you would get me a recumbent bike. So yeah. I'm going to take that bike ride. Yeah, with and you. you'll ride. And you'll You'll be sitting in a comfortable position. You have to get used to using your arms to ride. It's not so easy, but you can do it. And a lot of the, the men and women that have been injured, and a lot of them have leg injuries where they've lost legs mm -hmm. either below or above the knee, mm -hmm. they ride recumbent uh, bikes, uh, hand cycles, and they do it. And this fellow, Chris, by the way, he rode with me. I sponsored a ride from Ottawa to D.C., 880 miles on bicycles. Wow. And he rode, and he said to me, if I can ride that route, if I can do that, and not have anybody push me, and not anybody touch that bar that's in the bike of the back of the bike. Will you jump out of a plane with me? Now I'm thinking to myself. <laughs> you know, have you done way, that? Have you jumped yet? No. Oh but I got to, come on! You could go to the mountain. You could jump. Well, so this is what happened. So <laughs> he hadn't seen the route, and I knew it was very hilly, and I knew he was going to need some help getting up some of the hills where you get behind and you push. He did that. He had like this fellow, a, a marine, guarding the back of that pole, so I would never grab it. He did the whole ride, and he told every reporter from Ottawa to D.C. that he was going to do that ride without me helping. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
I just want to thank you so much um, for being here. And I know we have a lot of people watching. And I, I really loved your, your statement that you had made that, you know, that everyone's able to do what they want to do, what they can do, that there is no disability. And that's really been proven with the people that you've gotten to ride with or, or climb with. And I, and I think that your message is going to spread a lot of hope and inspiration. And you said that it's changed you. I know that it's changed me being on the other side. And I always like to end the segment line with you or my guests sharing some hope and inspiration to other people that are watching. Maybe they look at people differently or maybe they never thought that they can get involved with world team events and, you know, volunteer. And there's people out there and all these incredible adventures, you know, that you go on. Um, we'd love to see what well, inspiration you have for those watching. I can tell you a story. Um, the night before we went for the summit, we were at about 17,000 feet, and I couldn't sleep. It's very hard to sleep at elevation. So I got out of my tent at 2 in the morning, you know, which you got to be very careful, and I was sitting, and uh, the stars, you know, the Milky Way galaxy was out there. And I, I remember feeling so alone, and I thought, why am I feeling so alone? I'm surrounded by 30 people on this expedition, and it's funny that we all feel so alone, but maybe in the end, right. when you look up there, all we have is each other. There may be nothing else but what's on this earth. And we feel so disconnected. Mm -hmm. Why do we feel so disconnected? And particularly now with the pandemic, maybe we should remember, it is the American way to persevere. And we need to support each other. And like I say, if we all ride that road together, we'll get where we're going. Thank you so, so much for being here Thank and you. inspiring people and not only showing us how to treat certain people and how that can change us, but also giving hope and inspiration to people that are struggling with their business, mental health, any physical challenge, knowing that there's light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And on behalf of the LJ Show, I'd like to present to you a little gift. The LJ Show made a contribution to World Team Sports. In well, your honor. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice. Thank, thank you. you. So much. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here. When we get back, it's time for Ask LJ. Stay tuned. Hey, it's me, LJ. I'm only five feet, but my journey is huge. Right after marrying my sweetheart, my world suddenly collapsed. I endured multiple back surgeries and rare health conditions. And I saved a life in the process by donating my kidney. I hit rock bottom pretty hard, but now I'm on top. Since then, I've become a minister, a coach, and a media. And oh yeah, I also wrote a book. Now I'm fulfilling my lifelong dream and hosting my very own talk show, The LJ Show. Join me for stories of hope and inspiration. Welcome back. It's now time for... Some of our live audience members and some viewers sent in some questions that they'd like to ask me. So let's see what we got in store today. Okay. Okay, this is funny. Was your hubby accepting of your spiritual encounters? Ooh, okay. Um, yes, he's very, he's not here right now. But yes, he's very accepting and very supportive. I think when everything started going down, like I'm like, I see things and I'm hearing things and I really started to take some classes. I think at first he thought it was more like a hobby, like, oh, you know, okay, you're having fun taking some classes. And then he would be like, oh, that's a coincidence. That's a coincidence. Um, there's a lot of coincidences. And then after a while, he's like, there's no way that she could possibly know all of this stuff. And one quick story that I have is one day um, I was home. I was recovered from like some type of like dental procedure or surgery. And he went out and he had to go run a couple of things. And one thing I wrote was, you know, who did you just bump into? And he was literally like, I would have thought, if you weren't home recovering from this dental procedure, I would have thought like you were right, you know, behind me. I even knew who, who he was with. And I don't know, I don't know how I would have known that, but I did. And certain things that you just can't make up and certain things just kept happening. And uh, he started coming to my events and coming to see me work. And uh, he was just very supportive. After a while, I was like, okay, she, she's a medium. She's a psychic. She does this. So I think at first it's a little hard to believe, especially someone who, you know, may be skeptical or not really sure how it works. So it's a little, yeah. But he is accepting and supportive. So he's been running around doing all the errands for the show today. But, um, yeah, I don't know if he was always accepting. I think he was just open to it. And after we kind of experienced our own losses and he kind of had some experience of his, of his own, um, he became more of a believer and understanding. So, and now he's like my number one fan, along with my dad and my mom. <laughs> it's now time for a reading. So let me see who I have here. This is like on the spot. Okay, all right, I'll work with this. So I have a male um, stepping forward 
So I want to say something started in the lungs just because I keep hearing something along the lines of pulmonary. So I do feel we have trouble breathing. We have troubles in the lungs. I also feel that he would have worn um, some wife beaters underneath. And I also keep getting an M connection or the name Michael connected to him as well. It's either his name or connected to him, but I also want to reference a Michael or Michelle connected to him with this gentleman. So just, I can't see, so just raise your hand if you can take it. Uh, definitely on the overweight side, white beaters. Mm -hmm. Yep. So everything I said so far, starting in the pulmonary lungs, going to the rest of the region and spreading? Yeah. You understand it? And I also keep getting a reference to Peter Pan or Disney. So would you understand how he would be connecting or why he would be referencing Disney as well? I could see that. Okay, wonderful. And would you understand, because I also keep feeling, would there either be, I don't know if this is connected to the ornaments too, but I also feel like I want to talk about the decorations or the Disney ornaments. I also want to talk about the ornaments. Would you understand this? My mother decorated all the time. And would you understand the connection, the reference, that they want to reference a son or son-in-law? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Now, is there a little bit of separation in the family? Yes. So I want to bring that through as well. And I also keep feeling there being an apology. I won't go deep into that, but I also keep feeling I want to give an apology. Would you understand this? Absolutely. Because I just keep hearing, would you forgive me? And again, you don't have to answer that and you don't have to tell me, but I do keep feeling this person coming through for you and asking for forgiveness as well. And I also just keep feeling, number one, that he is at peace because I don't feel that someone may have been with him at his passing or we were out of touch. But I do feel like he passes peacefully, okay? I know he suffered a lot, but I do feel he's out of peace now, okay? And I just want to bring that to his to your attention as well. Just the, in the intention and the forgiveness because I feel like that's what's really important because I almost feel like we didn't talk here and I don't know that she would have talked to me while I was here. So he's like, I'm gonna talk from the other side. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And he knew you were gonna be at the show today. So I know there's a little bit of tension there but I do appreciate you being open and stepping forward and just knowing that he is coming through and there's a big light shining around him. So when I see that, I know that we've transitioned. We're different on the other side. We're not who we were here. And I also feel like he does wanna see the family together and I feel like that's part Part of a big life lesson and something for you as well forgiving and the family to forgive and the family to come back together okay thank you all right you're very welcome leaving him with love and blessings thank you so much for letting me know that made sense <laughs> it's time for a giveaway with lj and i want to begin by giving a huge thank you to our guest lon dolbert because you're all going home with 50 dollars visa gift cards <laughs> Thank you for joining us on our holiday special, and I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, and any holiday that you celebrate at this time. It has been a difficult time, especially with COVID and all that's going on in the world, but please remember to not lose your faith and keep that holiday spirit, and especially if you're missing a loved one right now or someone around you ill, or maybe you're separated in distance because of everything that's going on, I want you to know that they are in your heart and spirit will still be with you at the holiday table this year. So please take care of one another, check in on each other, and don't forget to call on your angels when you need some help. So love and blessings to you. Happy holidays from the LJ Show. Thank you.